Hello and welcome back to Physical Geology and today I want to go over the Earthquakes Lab uh, from your lab book and I've had to modify it a little bit just because I'm doing this online and I'll, I'll try to do some of the experiments with you and show you how to navigate through this lab. So the lab today we're you know, really starting this part that starts with liquefaction and I'll post this PDF on on canvas for you guys. But one thing about this lab, we're gonna skip the first part with the springs from your book, but the second part on this cornstarch, I'll make the cornstarch. If you want, you can make some at home. If you have some cornstarch, you can do this experiment, but I'll do it here and we'll make some observations. Just in order to talk a little bit about this, this idea of liquefaction and how these unconsolidated soils can really lose their integrity because essentially what happens, especially in sandy, loamy soils, is as soon as they get water saturated or pressure from an, earth, from an earthquake is squeezing, maybe moving water around more rapidly, what happens is, is the sand grains get saturated with water and the, and the pore spaces expand because they get full of water and the, the, grains are, the sand grains are no longer touching each other, so they slip, they fail, and they, they cause this idea of liquefaction. And one of the results of liquefaction, obviously, is uh, the foundations of buildings become unstable because it literally sink into this liquefied sand and kind of tumble over here, like in this example of the 1964 earthquake in Japan. Or you can have a sand, little sand volcanoes uh, coming up from this mobilized liquefied sediment. So here are the little sand volcanoes. Over here in the Fraser River Delta in British Columbia is another example here. All right, so we'll do this experiment. I'll make the cornstarch here following these directions. Again, you can do this on your own. And I have the materials here. I have the cornstarch and I'll have, I have one cup of cornstarch and I'll get the water going and let's make this. Give me a couple minutes. Maybe you can work on this while I'm making mine. Okay, so I've made mine and mixed my cornstarch. And in the lab, it says that we need to make our cornstarch into a ball. You can see it's kind of liquidy there. You can see it's kind of flowing, but when I grab it, it gets, gets pretty hard and it starts to crack. So what I'll do, I need to, it says to, using your bare hands, form the material into a ball about the size of a tennis ball. So I'll grab this material here, and then I'll see if I can make it into a tennis ball here. You can see when I move it around, and I'm not, it kind of flows, but then it gets hard. So it's really kind of an unusual substance there, right? So we'll keep moving this around, and we'll shift it make in our palms, keeping it, uh, keeping a light pressure on it to hold the material together. When the ball is well formed, we'll rest it on the tabletop and we'll see what happens. Okay, so now I have it into a pretty good ball here. Now I'm gonna rest it on the tabletop and see what happens. So you wanna make that observation. And then it says that we wanna do, so you can see what it kind of, how it's spread out. But now what we wanna do is, it says to kind of tear it apart and share it among your, your partners. But since, since we're working alone here, what we'll do is, uh, you can see that I can make a hard, here's a smaller piece, I can, make, and I, I can tear it. So you can see how it kind of tears into the sharp edge. Let's make that ball again. You can see if we can, we can repeat that. So I'm going to tear it. See how it tore? But then it becomes liquid. So that's some observations you need to make there. Yeah, so I can tear it, and I see sharp edges, but then suddenly it starts flowing, right? So it quickly turns into a liquid. Now it's, it's going to ask us for, for question number nine. We're going to reshape it into a ball and lay it back on the tabletop, and then we'll, we'll run the next experiment here. All right, for questions nine and ten, they're asking us, so once we have it into a ball again, we're going to lay it flat on the tabletop there, and we're going to take a marble or some sort of, if you don't have a marble, like I don't have a marble at home, but you can take some sort of round sphere and we're gonna roll this marble or sphere across the, and see what happens. And so you can see as I'm sort of, some of it's kind of sticking on there, so, but I gotta keep rolling it. If I stop rolling, it sticks. It's not really leaving a path. And then if I just leave it alone here, it starts to sink into the, yeah, it, starts to, it gets really hard to pull out. You see the little crater left there. So if I'm moving it around, I can roll it around pretty easily. So as long as I'm moving the marble, it can roll pretty easily. But as soon as I stop, 
it's sinking into, and even the material on the top is kind of flowing off the top here, sinking into the material, right? So that's something to make a note of. All right, so that kind of ends the experiment with the, the cornstarch. So, okay, so I completed the experiment for this first part on liquefaction. So again, there are some questions you have to answer based on the observations of the cornstarch and how it was sort of solid, but then when there was no pressure applied to it, it got kind of liquidy, kind of flowed like that liquefaction. So answer those questions there. And I rolled the ball across it there so you can answer that question. Uh, and then don't forget about question 13 here and how maybe, you know, cause as long as the building's moving on this softer material, maybe uh, it'd be more stable. So I would like to think, like to know what you would think about this question 13 here. All right, so the second part of the lab here deals with determining the locations of epicenters for earthquakes. And there's a couple of ways we can do it. Uh, and I'll show you both one using uh, something like this compass right here. So you will need some sort of compass to draw circles. Or uh, we could use Google Earth and I'll show you how to use Google Earth to draw circles. And maybe you can take a picture of the, um, or a screenshot of your Google Earth image at the end and submit that instead of the, the map that I have, have here for you. But nonetheless, uh, you will need to draw these circles either using a, a compass like this or maybe um, uh, using Google Earth. So uh, let's go back to the, to the actual PDF file because it's a little bit more clear. And so I'm going to show you how to do this a couple of different ways. So to, remember to determine the S minus P time interval, uh, we need to read those off the seismograms, right? So remember the seismogram is, is the printout from the seismograph. And the seismograph is the instrument that records amplitude of shaking. And always on these um, seismograms, the P wave is always first. It's primary, it's a faster wave. It's about 1.7 times faster than the S wave. And S wave is sometimes called the secondary wave or the shear wave because of the way it moves. So again, I talk about this in my video, so you should have some idea about what's going on here. So. To understand what's going on here, we want to record the, the time between the P and the S wave. The wider the time interval, the farther away the epicenter. So for these, we have three stations. We have one over here in Sitka, Alaska, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Honolulu, Hawaii. So your job is to record the, the arrival times for the P wave and then the S wave. So for the P wave, a simple thing we can do, we can actually draw a line here. And so just for my PDF viewer, or my preview, or you can, if you have Acrobat, you can draw a line here. I've drawn a straight line from the first arrival of the P wave. You want to do it right when it first arrives, right in there. And you can see for this one, it comes in like here's 807, uh, 808. So it's like 807.4. So for the S minus P interval, you would say it, for the P arrival for Sitka, Alaska, it would be, so, so in other words, um, 7.4 minute, minutes after eight. So now let's do the same thing. In fact, what you can do, you can just keep the same line because you already got a vertical line here. Let's move it over here and figure out when the S wave arrives. So the S wave arrives right there. So when the first arrival, it looks like 811.4, 811.4. The math, doing the math, so in this case, I would just take 11.4 because it's, remember it's S minus P. So 11.4 minus 7.4. 11.4 minutes minus 7.4 gives us four minutes, right? So the S minus P time interval here will be four minutes. So that's how you calculate the S minus P interval. So we, I just did it for Sitka, Alaska. And so your job would be to do the, do the same thing for Charlotte, North Carolina, and for Honolulu. Same thing, you, you'd make your vertical line. In fact, now I can just, I can you know, shrink it down a little bit here and make it fit for, North Car for, for Charlotte, for the P and the S wave, and do the same thing for Honolulu over here. And then you'll write the numbers in here and, and calculate the S minus P time interval. Now, once we've done that, now we need to figure out the distance to the epicenter. And because the P wave is always traveling faster than the S wave, you'll see that the farther you get from the, from the epicenter, so in this case, we're getting farther in miles on this X axis, you see that the space between the P and S curve gets wider, right? So this region between the S and P curve is that S minus P time interval. It would be, it would exist somewhere in this region. 
Now we just calculated the time interval, S minus P time interval for, for Sitka, Alaska. And I said it was four minutes, right? So the way you do this, let's make another vertical line here. And if you hit the shift key, the shift key straightens it out. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bring it down here to zero. And I'm gonna, again, holding the shift key, I'm gonna stretch it out here to four minutes. See how I stretch it out to four minutes? So now, I, in fact, let's make this a different color. Let's make this a red color so, so we can see it better. So now this line that, I, that you see here represents four minutes and I've calibrated it to this time scale on the y-axis here. Now I'm free to move this anywhere I want on this graph. And again, the distance from here to the top here represents those four minutes. So remember, my job is to figure out where the four minutes fits between the, the S curve here and the P curve. So the key is to keep the bottom of this line on the P curve and keep also this line parallel to the Y axis. And then as I move it around here, so I wanna see where it fits in here. You can see it's, that's too much. It's right around there. So now the bottom of this line touches the P curve and the top touches the S curve. So it fits right here. So that's telling me that the distance is uh, so this is 1,000, 1,100, 12, 13, 14, about 1,450 miles, 1,450 miles. So now you would do the same thing. Once you figure out the S minus P time interval for Charlotte, North Carolina, and Honolulu, you would come over here. Uh, let, let's say, for example, Charlotte was five minutes or five and a half minutes. So I would stretch this line up. There's five and a half right there. And now I, I would move this over. So again, hypothetically, you would be doing this. You can see that for five and a half, oh, I'm way over here at 2,500, right? So again, your job is to figure out where that S minus P interval fits. So again, this is just an example. You would have to do it for, um, for your particular values, right? So now you got the distance. So our job next is to plot it on this map of the world, right? And one interesting thing about this, uh, you got I got the latitude and longitude. So remember, for 57 degrees north, that's so 50, 60 is there, 57 somewhere in here. There's going to be a curved line going down this way. And for latitude, we're 135 west. Remember, the prime meridian is over in England, so we're going, so we're going farther west. The numbers get bigger as you go to the west. So we're at 135 for Sitka. So 130, 135 would be here. It intersect, intersects. 57, and I know Sitka, Alaska is right on the coast, so we're gonna put a, a mark right there. So there's our position for Sitka, Alaska. So you would do the same thing. You would plot for Charlotte, North Carolina, and then Honolulu, Hawaii is over here at 158 and 21 degrees, which is gonna be right in here, right? So you would plot those numbers similar to Sitka, Alaska. So now your job is to plot this. So I'm gonna show you two ways of doing it. One way using this map here and the compass, and the other way we'll do it is to use the, um, the Google Earth.